All right, all righty. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about the short put strategy, but specifically for small accounts. And the reason I wanted to create this video was because not too long ago, I released this video on my channel. I call it the 5K per month passive income strategy. So basically this video is where I shared the short put strategy where you can use it to generate passive income. Now, I had a lot of people reach out to me after I created this video that they like this strategy a lot, but I also had a few people that said, you know, they want to implement this strategy, but they can't because their account size is not too big, right? For example, one of the people that actually reached out to me said this, Davis, I really love your video on the short put strategy and want to trade it, but I have a small account of under $5,000. So most of the examples you shared are too expensive for my account size. How can I apply this strategy to my small account size? So this is a very, very good question. So first of all, you need to understand which of the short put strategy you're actually trading. So when you're trading the short put, there's actually two types of strategy that you can trade, right? The very first one is the cash secure put. Right, so the cash cap put basically your intention is to long the underlying shares, right? So for every put option that you sell, basically you want to get assigned on this put option, which means that you're gonna get long a hundred shares at the strike price that you choose. So for this strategy, it's generally more capital intensive and the DTE selection is actually less important, right? Because you don't mind getting assigned, right? The whole idea of strategic DTE selection usually comes down to whether you want to get assigned or not, at least in my case, the way I trade it. So if you don't mind getting assigned, then, you know, cash to cut put, the DT selection is not that important. And you can actually leave to expiration because you don't mind getting assigned, right? It's not like you want to avoid assignment. So that's the cash to cut put. Now, the other way to trade the short put is with the naked put. So the naked put basically just means that you have no intention to long the underlying shares, right? That means you just want to get into the options and get out of the options with no assignment whatsoever. So when you trade this naked put, basically it's less capital intensive because there's no need for you to go long the 100 shares per option. And for this, for the naked put, DTE selection is actually very important, right? Because you want to choose the right DTE that actually gives you an edge in the long term. And also, leaving to expiration can lead to early assignment risk and potential margin call, right? Because most of the time, chances are that your account size is not going to be big enough for you to long the 100 shares. So for this video, we're not going to be talking about the cash secure put, but instead, we're going to be talking about the naked put. So the name by itself may sound scary, right? But naked put really just means that you're trading options without any intention to long the underlying shares, all right? So this is very important. So when you get into this naked put, you can have unlimited loss to the point whereby the stock goes to zero. So you really need to know what you're gonna do. So if you wanna trade this short put, which is basically the naked put on a small account size, then there are a few things that you really need to take note of, right? So first thing is that if you have a small account, right, chances are that you're gonna have a big limitation into the kind of underlying that you can trade, right? For example, if I were to just do this on the IWM, right? So IWM is the smallest of the three index ETFs, the main ones, basically the IWM, the SPY, as well as the QQQ, right? There's also the diamonds, but of all of them, the smallest one is IWM. As you can see, it's about 205 as of this recording. So if you were to just put on a short put based on this IWM, you can see that I chose one that is around 30 Delta, with the 193 strike price, you can see that straight away, the buying power for this is about $2,000. So what is this buying power effect? So buying power effect basically just means the amount that the broker is gonna hold for you to put on this trade, right? And one thing you need to understand is that this buying power is not static. That means to say it can fluctuate, right? For example, if after putting it on, if the market becomes very volatile, well, it's possible that your broker can actually increase the buying power effect. That means this can actually go all the way to higher than $1,930, right? Maybe it can go to $2,000 plus. And this is very important to note because if you're going to trade the naked put in your account, you need to make sure that your position size is proper. So with the limitation of your uh, small account, trading the short put on such index ETFs, right? Such kind of underlying that is higher price, is gonna be a problem, right? As you can see, $2,000 is gonna take a big chunk of your account, right? Assuming your account size is $5,000. So one thing you can straight away do actually is to turn it into a put spread, 
right? You can see down here, we still have the 193 strike price, but then now we are going to buy a further out of the money put option, which is at 187. So what you have done down here is that you have actually limited the risk on this trade, right? So as you can see down here, your buying power effect is actually now much lesser. Previously, it was about $1,900. Now it's $453. So you can see that just by buying that put option, you are able to sort of trade the put strategy, right? But the problem is that this is a put spread and not exactly a short put. And I understand from some people, right, because you have reached out to me and say that you specifically want the short put, not the put spread, mainly because of the two advantages, right? So for those of you who are not aware of the advantage of the short put versus the put spread, is that there are basically two main advantages, right? The very first main advantage is that you have the pure theta decay. Pure theta decay because you only have one short option. Whereas for the put spread, there's the friction from the long option, right? Because you have the short option as well as the long option because you're going to buy a further out of the money long put. So when you have that long put option, the theta decay is not going to be as quick as compared to the short put. And the other advantage is that it's easier to roll even when it's in the money. So one thing you will find that with a short put, even though it's in the money, you can actually still roll it, right? You can roll it out and down because it's just one singular option. But what you will find is that for the put spread, most of the time, if it's in the money, you're going to find that it's actually going to be very difficult for you to roll for a credit, right? So for example, this is the put spread. So you can see down here, you have a minus one down here and then plus one down here, you have the put spread down here. So if the market actually comes down here, let's say for example, it comes closer to where this long put is, chances are this put spread, when you roll it, it's going to be for a debit, right? So if it's for a debit, chances are that you don't want to roll it because you're going to be actually paying more. Whereas for the short put, if you just have this short put alone and same thing, if it goes down, you will find that actually you are able to still roll this for a credit, right? You can still roll out to a further expiration date and then roll down the strike price as well and try to find one where you can get a credit. So that is why, you know, quite a number of people have mentioned that, yes, I understand that the put spread is much more safer in a sense because, you know, if the market crashes, you still only lose whatever you reach at the start. But at the same time, they want a short put because they want to get a quicker profits right so if you talk about quickness in terms of profit short put will be always faster because there's no friction from the long option at the same time it's also easier to roll so this is where a lot of people want to do this right whenever it's in the money they want to keep rolling out and down until the point where the market eventually recovers and go back up and then they're going to be profit on the whole position so I understand this point. So what we're going to do is that we are going to try and cater this short put strategy just for the small account. So the question now becomes, how do you trade short puts for small accounts? Well, the answer is really pretty simple. And the answer is to simply find underlyings that are lower price, right? Maybe for example, under $50. Because remember, when you put on the short put, you need to identify what is the buying power. Basically, what is the amount that the broker is going to hold for you to put on the trade? So if you're going to do it on IWM, for example, like I showed you earlier, you can see there is such a big amount, right? So there's no way for you to put up this uh, short put on a small account. So instead, what you want to do is to straight away find the underlying that is much cheaper. So here are a few examples, right? So first of all, let me remind you, please do your own due diligence, right? Don't just take the list down here and then just put it on your own, right? You need to find out whether this underlying is suitable for you. So it's not a recommendation for you to trade any of these stocks. I'm just pointing out some of the underlines that I see that can be suitable in terms of the buying power requirement, which you can actually put on your account. So let's assume you have maybe a $5,000 account. So the very first example would be Palantir. Right, so as you can see, Palantir as of this recording is around $27. So it's not very expensive. And if you were to just put on the put option down here, so as you can see, I've selected the 24 strike, which is roughly around 30 deltas. You can see that the buying power is only $240, which is not too bad. So if you have a $5,000 account, you can definitely put on this trade. Or maybe if you even have a smaller account size like $3,000, you can definitely still put on this trade because you can see that the buying power is not that much.
Now, another example would be Ford Motors, right? So the ticker symbol is F. As you can see down here, Ford is even cheaper, right? At this recording, Ford is only roughly about $9.87. And the strike price that I've chosen is $9. So again, roughly about 30 deltas. And you can see for this, the buying power that you need to put on this trade is only $111 which is not so much, right? So if you have a small account, definitely you can put this on. Now the next one is Pfizer. So ticker symbol PFE, as you can see, Pfizer is roughly around $30. So pretty similar to Palantir. And if you were to put on the strike price of 27.5, Delta roughly about 21, then you can get a buying power of roughly $361. Again, it's not that much, right? All this buying power you notice is under $500. So it's very simple for you to put on this uh, short put if you want to. But of course, do not just put on this short put just because, you know, it's a cheap underlying. You still have to find the right setup and have proper risk management, which I'm going to share with you in a later slide later on. Now, here are a few other examples. Now, this is for the index ETF. So stocks can be a little bit more volatile. So if you're the kind of person that, you know, one slightly less volatile underlying, then you can go for the index ETF, right? For example, one of them is GDX. So GDX is the VanEck Gold Miners ETF. You can see down here, uh, using the strike price of 34, you have the buying power of slightly above $500. You have the GDXJ, which is the junior gold miners. So same thing as well. The strike price of $39, you get you know the buying power of roughly $535. And finally, SPLG. So SPLG basically is S&P 500, right? It's the same as SPY, only that this is much, much cheaper, right? As you can see, this is only about $61. So for example, if you want to trade S&P 500, but then, you know, SPY is way too big. You can actually consider this SPLG because if you put on the 58 strike price, you can see that the buying power is about $580. So definitely much more suitable if you have a small account and if you also want a safer way, you know, to trade this short puts. So one thing that you will find is that with some of this underlying, the spread can be pretty wide. So as you can see down here, the spread is $1.25 to $1.75. So it's pretty wide. Uh, down here as well, you see $150 to $2.05. So this is one thing you need to take note of if you were to choose some of this lower price underlying. All right, so let's get into the actual steps of how do you put on the short put strategy for small accounts. By the way, if you like this video so far, please subscribe and also click the thumbs up button and also do get your free copy of the Options Income Blueprint where I share the top three option strategies that help you generate a consistent income each month trading just one to two hours a day, right? So if you want to go ahead to get this copy, just head on over to optionswithdavis.com slash blueprint. All right, back to the video. So step number one is to build a watch list of low price stocks and index ETFs, you know, preferably under $50 because that's where you are able to have the short put whereby the buying power is, you know, uh, manageable, right? Basically under $500. Now the second step, now that you've already built a watch list of all these low price stocks and index ETFs, what you want to do is to go through each of them, right? Go through each of them and try and find the ones that are in an uptrend, right? So as you can see down here, this is an underlying that is pretty much in an uptrend, right? So how do you identify an uptrend? So basically uptrend will have this characteristic where it's forming these waves, right? Basically it will form higher highs and then higher lows. So once you've found the underlyings that is in an uptrend, now this is where you get into step number three and you add the indicator that's called the stochastic oscillator, right? So the stochastic oscillator basically is an indicator that kind of tells you whether the market is in an overbought or oversold condition, right? So as you can see down here, I've already attached this uh, stochastic oscillator at the bottom down here. So basically what you will see is that if this blue line goes above the red line at the top, then this is what is called overbought. But if it goes below the red line at the bottom, then this is what is called oversold. So what we want to look out for when we are trading the short put is for the oversold signal to come out, right? We want to see that the squiggly line is below this red line before we decide to enter into any trade, right? So this is where you want to put more odds in your favor. Now, that is not to say that after it's oversold that the market is immediately going to bounce up, right? We never know, right? Because oversold can go a little bit more oversold and the market can still continue to go down. What's important again, like I mentioned all the time, is that we are basing it off probability. And if you were to think about it from a very strategic point of view, 
which is much better for you to enter? When the market is overbought, do you enter the short put when it's overbought, when the market is going up, or when the market has already gone down quite a bit and it's oversold and there's a likely chance that there can be a bounce, right? So most likely you want to enter the short put when it's oversold. So once you've already identified the underlines that is oversold, you get into stock four. This is where you also want to identify support levels, right? So again, support levels are places where you can see that the prices have bounced off and you can see that maybe there's a chance for the price to go up again. So again, we're just adding more things into our favor, right? Adding the odds in our favor. So this way, at least every trade that we put on, at least there's a greater chance of it working out than it does not. But that is not to say that you won't have losers, all right? So just remember that losses will come. It's inevitable. You just have to make sure that when the losses come, you manage them properly. So once you've identified the support levels, then this is where we get into step number five, and this is where you enter into the short put, right? So what we want to do is we want to identify the strike prices that is below the support down here. So let's say, for example, if you know that the support is around $30, right? So let's say the support is at $30, then you want to go for the strike prices that is below $30, right? So if you're a little bit more bullish, then you can probably go for the short put strike price that is just below the support, right? So if you go for one that's just below the support, what you're going to find is that you're going to get higher premiums, but then your probability of profit is going to be lower, Right, so this is always a trade-off. But let's say you're a little bit more conservative, right? You don't want to go for one that is close to the support level. You want to play it safe. You want to go for a further out of the money put option. So in this case, what you will find is that you will have lesser premium, but you're going to have a higher win rate, right? So this is always a trade-off. So which one is better? There's not one that's better. It really all comes down to you. So you just need to understand that as long as you place the put option below the support level, then at least you've already stacked the odds in your favor. Because remember, number one, we have the market trending upwards. So this gives us an indication that there is a likelihood that the market can still continue to go up. Right. And secondly, we also have the stochastic oscillator that is telling us that it's currently in an oversold condition. So the market has already sold off quite a bit. That means it could reach a point whereby, you know, it's a little bit exhausted to the downside and then it can come back up. And finally, thirdly, we also have this support level down here. So this support level gives you an added chance that, you know, if the market actually comes down to this support level again, there's a chance that it could bounce back up. So with all this in place, and you also have the short put that is below the support level, you should be able to find such kind of setups that gives you, you know, pretty high probability of entry. So now that we've already gone through this last step of entering into the trades, let's get into the most important one, which is step number six, that is the exit tactics. So this is where quite a number of people really fumble and panic, especially when the market really crashes, right? So you really need to know what to do especially with a short put. Remember, right now, with a short put, this is a naked put, there is no protection to the downside from a long put option, right? There's no long put, so it's not a put spread. So in this case, you really need to be very sharp as to how to manage it if your put option is in a loss. So first of all, let's talk about what if this put option is in a profit, right? So if it's in a profit, it's actually pretty simple, right? This is where a lot of people will probably also know how to manage. So there are a few ways to do this. Number one, you can just exit at 50% take profit, right? So 50% take profit is basically just half of the credit that you receive. So for example, if you receive say $2.50 for this credit, what is the take profit of this, right? Basically the take profit of this would be at $1.25. So a lot of people do get confused because when you're new to trading, you know, options, especially selling options, you need to understand that what you're doing is that you always sell at a higher price and you want to buy back at a lower price, right? So if you sell it at $2.50 and you buy back at $1.25, then you're actually in a profit of $1.25. So per option contract, that is $125. But if you see the option price at the point of time is above $2.50, so let's say, for example, it's at $3.50. So what this is telling you is that your trade is in a loss, right? Because you sold it at $2.50, but if you were to buy back at $3.50, this is actually going to be a loss of a dollar, which is $100 per option contract. So for us as option sellers, we want to see that the current price, the option price that it's marking for is less than what we sold it for, 
right? So a 50% take profit is basically just half of the credit that you receive upfront for selling this option. Now, the other way you can manage it is at 21 DTE. So I've shared this in quite a number of my videos already. You can just go ahead to look at some of my videos in my channel. But 21 DTE basically is a study that the Tasty Trade team has already done that if you were to exit at 21 DTE, in the end, you're going to have you know much more superior performance compared to if you were to just hold all the way to expiration, right? But with that said, I know that some people do want to have the option of holding to expiration because after all, if the market is above your short put strike, right? Imagine it keeps going up, then why not just capture the whole premium that is given to you at the start, right? This whole two dollar and fifty cents. So some people have that thinking. So you know, if you want to hold to expiration, you can definitely do so as well. But just remember this, any option will only generally go to $0 at expiration. So let's say, for example, if you put this on roughly at 45 DTE, and then let's say about 10 days in, 10 days in, that means now it's at 35 DTEs. So if it's at 35 DTEs and you see that you've already made, let's say maybe about $2, that means to say this 250 has dropped down to 50 cents. Right, so you have already made two dollars on this trade, which is two hundred dollars, because the market has just gone up, right? But for you to make that remaining fifty cents, you have to wait another thirty-five days. Does it make sense for you to wait thirty-five days when you've already made, you know, two dollars in just ten days? So what you're doing at that point of time is that you're risking the additional two dollars you already made uh, on the remaining thirty-five days, right? Just so that you can make this fifty cents. So most of the time, I wouldn't say that would make sense at all. So you would rather just take it off uh, rather than risk the whole thing. So at the end of the day, it's really up to you to decide. So I'm just giving you a guideline over here. Now, the next one. So this is a very important one to understand, which is the loss. And a lot of people just do not manage it well, right? So one thing you need to really keep in mind and really take note is that losses will come. Losses will happen. A lot of people want to get into trades avoiding this loss, right? So for example, if you get into a 30 delta short put, so roughly it will be a 70% win rate, right? So you will win 70% of 10. But what it also means is that you will lose 30% of the time. 30% of the time, it will be a loss and the probability already depicts it, right? You cannot avoid this loss. So when the loss happens, you really need to know how to manage it well and not let this short put really blow up your account. Because some people, you know, they do not want to take the loss. They hope that the market will come back up. They hold on to the trade only to see that the market continue to crash and then they lose a lot much more than what they initially wanted. So how do you define this loss? So the very first thing, the most important thing is to understand where your max cutoff point is. That means this is the worst case scenario, the maximum loss you can make. So the maximum loss you want to cap it really is at the initial buying power for the trade. So remember earlier I shared with you that whenever you put on the short put, your broker will show you this buying power effect, right? Or buying power reduction, depending on you know, what's the term that your broker use. But basically it's the amount that the broker holds on to the trade for, the, for you to put on the trade, right? So this initial buying power is where you want to cut off the loss. Now, let's say for example, if you put on this short put and let's just say that the buying power for this is $250, which means to say, if it reaches to a point whereby the market drops so far down that you see that the open loss for this trade is $250, what you want to do is immediately close out this trade. Why? Because if you don't do that and the market continues to crash all the way down to zero, then you can lose a lot more money. And we don't want that to happen. So that is why this is the worst case scenario. Once it reaches your initial buying power, you have to cut it off. Now, what if it doesn't reach your initial buying power, right? So the good news is that the chances of it reaching the initial buying power is not that high because the broker have already set aside an amount that they want to hold on from you to a point whereby they think that it's unlikely for the market to get there. That means to say that the market really has to go way down for you to ever reach this amount, right? Which is why the broker actually holds on to this amount. So the chances of you reaching this is not that high. So what do you do then? In that case, this is where you want to exit at 21 DTE the later. So it could be that, you know, the market has already gone past your short put, right? So this short put down here is what you call in the money. So if you're in the money, 
there is always a chance of the early assignment risk. Right? Early assignment risk just means that your short put is going to get assigned, you're going to get the 100 shares. If you don't have the funds for the 100 shares, you're going to get a margin call. So to avoid this, or rather to reduce the chances of this, you want to exit at 21 DTE the latest, which means to say there's 21 days left to the expiration of this option. So why 21 DTE? Well, firstly, because again, back to the Tasty Trade study, they have already shown that based on 21 DTE, you get much more superior performance, including the losses, right? Because you are cutting the losses at a point whereby it's manageable. But if you were to leave it all the way to maybe even expiration, the loss could get very big if the market continues to go down. So 21 DT, you cut the loss to a minimum. At the same time, you have a reduced chance of getting assigned, right? Because at 21 DT, you still have some extrinsic value. So when you have still some extrinsic value in this short put, the chances of being assigned is not that high. So that is why if you are seeing that you are lost and then you know it's not at your max loss yet of the initial buying power, once it's reached 21 DT, exit it. Now, there's one more option, right? This is the option that a lot of people want to do, and that is to roll out and down your put option, right? That means, for example, if the current put option has maybe about, say, 25 DTEs left. So what you want to do is that you roll it out to a further timeline, right? So maybe you go to the next 45 DTE. So when you extend it, and have more time, you're going to have more extrinsic value, you're going to have the premium as well. At the same time, you can bring the strike price down as well. So you can have a lower strike price and overall for a premium. But the key thing down here is that you only do this if you are still bullish. Because if the stock is going to keep crashing even after you roll, no matter how many times you roll down and out, you're still going to get caught. Right? It's still going to be a loss and your loss is going to just only keep increasing and increasing as the market goes down. So this is only if you still hold a bullish view on the underlying. But if you don't hold a bullish view on the underlying, then basically just exit at 21 DTE. So roll up and down. So how do you roll this? So there are two ways you can do this. The first way is when the short put is breached. So this is the most defensive one. When you roll out and down, the moment your short put is breached, basically you're able to roll it to a further away strike price, right? Because this is a time where your extrinsic value is quite high. So you want to choose a further DTE. So one thing is that if you were to roll it when the short put is breached, what you will find is that sometimes you can get to a point where the DTE is just too huge. For example, let's say when you put on this option, it's 45 DTE. And the moment you put it on, let's just say the next day, the market has just traded all the way down, right? It crashed and then it reached your short put strike. Now at this point, if you want to roll out in time, you might have to roll to a much further time, right? Maybe 67 DTE on, and so on. So now you've gone much further in time, which also means that the theta decay is not going to be that high as well because theta generally tends to decay much quicker as the days to expiration the dte becomes lesser and lesser and lesser so 67 is still quite a bit so imagine if you really roll it down to this point down here and then all of a sudden you know in the next few days the market goes down again and if the market goes down to the next uh, point in time whereby you roll it to then if you want to roll it now you may have to go for an even further one so maybe now you have to go to like 90 dtes or something like that so when you do it this way, chances are you may reach a point whereby you have no choice but to stop rolling because the DTE gets a little bit too big. So that's the very first way, right? This is the most defensive way. Now, the second way is at 21 DTE. So that means you don't care what the market is doing, right? As long as the market does not reach the initial buying power for the trade, that means the max loss cutoff point, if it doesn't reach there, you just wait until it's 21 DTE and see where the market is, right? Let's say if the market is somewhere here, then this is where you try and roll it again. So you roll up and down. So if at this point, if the market is really below the short put, then you can actually still roll it down for a credit, right? Roll up and down. But the problem is that you may not roll down as far, right? You may not be able to get a strike price that is much, much lower, and it could still be in the money. But on the other side is that if the market at 21 DT actually went up, then chances are that you don't even have to roll at all, right? Or if the market actually comes down to where it's at the money, then you can actually roll for a much, much uh, better 
uh, strike price much lower at the same time because it's at 21 DT, you can always go back to the 45 DT. So this way, you know, your theta decay is still reasonable, right? Compared to if you were to roll all the way out to about 90 DT or even 100 plus DT. All right, so these are the six steps to put on the short put strategy for small accounts. And hopefully if you follow all the steps and things go in your favor, then you should be able to see you know, an outcome something like this. By the way, if you like this video, then you're absolutely going to love this next video which I have for you. So go ahead and watch that video right now. Also, if you haven't already gotten your free copy of the Options Income Blueprint, you can do so just by clicking this link down here on your screen and you'll be able to get it for free. Alright, I will see you in the next video.